Ink Ribbon. Whether you're a fan of the original Resident Evil 2 or part of the newer generation of gamers playing it for the first time, we can all agree that Resident Evil 2 Remake is an amazing game. Since we're gearing up for the release of Resident Evil 3 Remake, I thought this would be a great time to bring you my list of developer secrets and easter eggs for Resident Evil 2 Remake. What the fuck? What the fuck? Number 10. Nods and References Throughout the entirety of the game are tons of references to both the original game and other games in Capcom's library. Here are some of the ones I found. At the beginning of the second scenario, you can see Brad Vickers on a poster in the guard room. Only natural that they would choose the bravest member of STARS to be the face of the RPD. At the beginning of the game there's graffiti with the letters TP. This one might be a stretch, but there's speculation that this graffiti at the beginning may be a reference to PT. Another character reference can be found across the street from Kendo's gun shop. Mikhail's pierogies, referencing our man Mikhail, who is in Resident Evil 3. The tiny mannequin on the desk where you get the spade key is a shrunken version of the mannequins in Resident Evil 7. You can also find them in the storage room on the third floor when playing as Claire. Early in the game is a poster that references Dead Rising. Sort of. I'm not sure why they didn't use his real name, but you can see a poster that has the name Frank East on it as a photographer available for hire which is all very obvious reference to Frank West. Speaking of Frank West, did you know that the voice of William Birkin is TJ Rotolo, the same voice actor as Frank West? She is my creation! I've covered wars, you know. When you get to the RPD office, you can see that the big banner that says Welcome Leon has a space missing after the L. If you inspect one of the desks, you can see that there is another L that was taken down. This is a nod to the original Resident Evil 2, where Welcome Leon was accidentally spelled with two L's. In the orphanage, you can see a few stuffed animals, including a big, cuddly stuffed alligator under the stairs. Comparing it to the sewer gator is a nod to the giant alligator later in the game. This was a recycled asset from Resident Evil 7 as well. While we are here, if we turn around and look at the chalkboard, you can see a drawing of Lottie, Natalia's bear from Revelations 2. While there aren't any giant spiders in the game, if you look at a few points in the sewers, you can see remnants of giant spiderwebs hanging from the ceiling. And lastly, we have Wesker. Well, sort of. No matter how hard you listen, you can't make out anything through the radio static, but that is Wesker speaking to Ada in this cutscene. Number 9 Gas Station I decided to make a whole entry just for the gas station because it's the most easter egg dense area in the whole game. First are the license plates to each character's vehicles. On Leon's Jeep is the word Matilda, which refers to his signature handgun, named as a reference to the movie Leon the Professional. Then Claire's license plate, which is the release date of the original Resident Evil 2. You can see this date a second time as a phone number on the door as you enter the gas station. Next to the entrance is a big ice cream container with herb ice cream that has the slogan, It Will Heal You, and even includes the yellow herbs from Resident Evil 4. And lastly, if you wait a bit after exiting the back room, the sheriff will turn into a zombie and prevent you from going back in. Number 8 out of bounds. One of the only real glitches in the game gives you the ability to completely walk through walls, leave the map areas, and skip large portions of the game, though this can cause problems if not done carefully. This has been patched, but it's still possible to do in certain areas. To do this trick, get a zombie to crawl and grab your leg from behind while at the very first step of a staircase. The easiest place to do this is on the stairs of the library. If precise enough, the character will now be walking on air. Next, walk over to where you would normally fall through the second floor and you will go lower than intended, which allows you to leave the map. It's worth noting that you can also do this in the sewers and a couple other places in the game. Number 7 Second Orphanage 
Speaking of out of bounds, there is actually a bit of a secret area in the game. Near the orphanage is a second orphanage that is unfinished. It was most likely a beta version of the level that accidentally got left in the game's data. There really isn't too much to see, but it is there, and it definitely has a different feel to the original and even has some textures. Based on the concept art, I'm guessing this room might have been a nursery, but I guess only the devs can confirm that. Number 6 Adaptive Difficulty Ever since Resident Evil 4, Capcom has used a secret sauce in their game design formula, and that is Adaptive Difficulty. So for those of you who don't know what that means, basically, the better you perform in the game, the harder it gets, and vice versa. Now the specifics of how it works exactly have always been a bit of an enigma in every game it's part of, but for Resident Evil 2, this is basically how it works. There are a few variables, but they typically revolve around how many times you are bitten and die, as well as how much ammo and healing items you have on you. Every time you take damage, the game gets a little bit easier in a lot of little ways. And if you're doing really well, and not taking any damage, the game will get more and more difficult to keep you on your toes. As the difficulty changes, the amount of damage that enemies cause changes, the amount of bullets from mixing powders changes, and the game spawns more or less enemies, and the amount of health that enemies have will change as well. And for those wondering, adaptive difficulty is disabled on hardcore mode. It is automatically set to max for the whole run. Number 5 Tofu I still see people getting surprised by this, so I thought it was worth mentioning. After you beat the game, you unlock the extra mode called the 4th Survivor, where you get to play as Hunk. Beating this unlocks the Tofu Survivor mode, which is identical except that you play as a block of tofu equipped with only a knife. However, if you can beat this very difficult mode, you can unlock two extra tofu type characters, each with their own arsenal and gameplay style. First is Cognac. Cognac's arsenal is fire themed, consisting of a flamethrower with plenty of ammo, and a grenade launcher with flame rounds. In Japanese cuisine, cognac is a thick gelatinous block made from lime water and cognac flour, which is made from the large purple flower of the same name. I've had it, and honestly, it doesn't really taste like anything. Maybe a tiny bit salty or fishy? The next unlocked character is Oido Mochi, whose arsenal consists of 36 hand grenades. Oido Mochi is just flavored mochi, uh, which is a very stringy, chewy cake made from rice flour. It can be flavored with sakura blossoms, azuki beans, or in this case, green tea. If you beat this mode with either of these two, you will unlock the last two tofu types. First, we have Flan, whose extremely powerful arsenal consists of a minigun, spark shot, flash grenades, and a rocket launcher, and is by far the easiest character to beat this mode as. Now, you probably know what Flan is, but I should mention that Flan is called Pudin in Japan. And last is Anin Tofu, who is equipped with a quick draw army pistol and an M19, as well as tons of handgun ammo. Anin Tofu, or Almond Tofu, is a soft gelatinous dessert made from apricot kernel milk, agar, and sugar, and is one of my personal all time favorite desserts. If you ever get a chance to try it, I highly recommend it. Number 4. Mr. X. One of the key enemies in the game needs no introduction and has caused more jump scares than anything else in the game. And there's good reason for this. Since the Mr. X of PS1 days, technology has come a long way, and Mr. X's ability to find the player was a standout feature. But you might be wondering exactly how his AI works. Well, for the most part, it works the same way you do. He has a sense of sight, sound, and touch, as well as the capability to search a room before moving to the next one. While this is terrifying, it can also work to your advantage if you know what you're doing. If positioned correctly, you can hide from him, and if you're stealthy enough, you can even follow him. By staying out of his field of vision and walking slowly, as long as he doesn't look in your direction, he won't sense you. But this comes with a cost which is that the longer he goes without spotting you, the more sensitive and aggressive he gets. Sounds like running and kicking open doors can attract him, but the fastest way that he will find you is if you fire your gun, minus the machine gun if it's equipped with the silencer. So, if you want to avoid him, sometimes hiding in the corner might be your best option. Number 3 Audio 
One of the most overlooked aspects in the Resident Evil 2 remake is the sound design. The original Resident Evil 2 was actually ahead of its time in the sound department and the remake holds up that tradition. If you have never played the remake with a good pair of headphones, you are really missing out on some fantastic sound design. There are actually three simultaneous sound systems working together to create the overall experience. Utilizing a revolutionary new real-time binaural system, which is the first stereophonic sound system of its kind, the player is able to have sounds that can simultaneously sound close by and far away for each ear. The second system, dubbed the Impulse Response Creation, is a reverb system which modulates each sound you hear depending on the size and texture of whatever room you're in. So while the back room of the gas station will sound intimate and warm, the RPD hall will be large and echoey. And last is the Dolby Atmos support, which is just to make sure the overall mixing of all the sounds is perfect, that way nothing is too loud or too quiet, and it shows. Seriously, the next time you play the game, put on a pair of headphones and just listen, and you will be able to really appreciate the work that went into the sound. Number 2 Unused Assets As with any game, there are things that didn't make it in, but in this game it's a little bit different. While there are concepts that were never used, there are also a lot of assets hidden in the game's files that were never used or mentioned anywhere in the game. First, we have the unused enemy concepts. Among these are wheelchair zombies as well as what seems to be a zombie liquor hybrid. Neither of these enemies left the concept phase of production. The following however is all in the game's files. Mr. X has two unused animations, however it is possible to trigger them in the extra modes. They both relate to him being hit by the spark shot. He also has an unused instant kill animation where he throws the player down and then punches their head in. It's also worth mentioning that the model of Chris Redfield from Resident Evil 7 is also hidden in the game's files, but has no data or programming associated with him. And last, but probably most interesting, are the unused key items. In the icon for the DLC that unlocks everything, you can see a key that is never seen in the game. This is the wolf key, to which there is also an unused eagle key. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. There are about 50 items that went unused, most of which are blank models with no textures. These include almost every key item from the original as well as some interesting ones like Leon's box, Claire's box, gunsmithing tool, continue coin, warhead tool, and so many other odd ones. I have a hunch that a few of these might be in the Resident Evil 3 remake, but we will have to see. I wish I could tell you more about them, but there's literally no data on these items. Number 1 Development The last and possibly most interesting thing about the remake is seeing glimpses of its development cycle and all the changes the team made. Development started in August 2015, being worked on alongside Resident Evil 7, and during a roundtable conference special held by Capcom, they showed small clips of early development which I compiled all the best parts of here. Early on there is a lot of footage where they were testing out different types of fixed camera modes, which is nice to know that they did consider it at one point. There is also footage of the character going into a first person mode as well. There were also apparently sections of the game that involved driving a car that were cut out and in the test footage there was a dog in the player's inventory for some reason, but that's most likely not intentional. In the beta footage, it also looks like Marvin had a different storyline, getting eaten by zombies in the office, which closer resembled the original. Here you can see some concepts that show how the inventory evolved, starting out looking much more like the classic inventory. The alligator scene also seems to have gone through several iterations, including one where the alligator has a lot more room to attack like a normal boss, as well as one iteration where Leon and Ada both get chased by it together. And last and possibly the saddest thing to be removed from the game is what appears to be co-op, or at least Claire as an AI controlled partner. And that is it for this list. I tried my best to find everything I could for you guys, but if there's anything that I missed, please let me know in the comments, send me a tweet, or join the Ink Ribbon Discord server. The links to all of those will be down in the description. If you like this video, then be sure to click that like button so that YouTube algorithm knows how much you love Resident Evil. And if you aren't subscribed yet, it would be very appreciated if you were. 
Thank you to the community for all the support. I'm Kai Morgan, and as always, thanks for watching Ink Ribbon. And a very special thank you to my bronze, silver, and gold Patreon supporters. Thanks to you, I can make videos without worrying about demonetization and grow my channel faster.